We are going to begin our worship service. Good to see you. I mean, it's really good to see you. And um, <laughs> I want to begin by saying thank you to Rick and to Dave especially, and to others who have done a number of things behind the scenes in my absence, but especially for the ministry of the word. And um, I thank you. And um, it is good to be back. I have some announcements to make. Um, tonight, of course, 6 p.m., we're going to continue in our series on Titus, which we stopped when I stopped coming a few weeks ago. But um, we'll continue that series tonight. And of course, we'll be singing together, worshiping the Lord together. And then Wednesday night, of course, 6 p.m. prayer uh, downstairs, just a reminder of that. And then on Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, Bible studies, the men here and then the women downstairs. Then we received a call this week from Rick Lautenbach. Now, not all of you know Bill and um, Connie Lautenbach, who are both in heaven, who were both here for decades, ministered here. Connie was our organist. Um, Bill was custodian here for I don't know how long, many, many years. Um, just dear, precious friends whom the Lord called home. But we didn't have uh, a chance to have memorial services for them because the family, which is scattered, wanted to come together uh, in March and have a combined service. And so they're going to do that here in this chapel on Saturday, March 5th, right? March, March 5th, right at 4.30, here. And we, of course, are invited. We're hosting the family group. They're going to be in town. They're going to either on Sunday or Saturday, go out onto the lake and scatter the ashes of, of Bill and Connie. But um, we just found out about that this week, so I wanted to let you know, mark your calendars, please. We will announce it each week, and we are looking forward to a time of worship and praise for these two uh, precious friends uh, who are now with the Lord. Saturday, March 5th at 430 those are all of the announcements. David, how are you doing now? I'm glad you're here. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm doing well. Good. You're, you're not jogging yet? No pole vaulting. Okay. Well, that'll come. But good to see you. And um, Diane, thank you for taking care of our boy. Where is she? Oh, there you are back there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, with that, I do invite you to stand, please. We're going to begin our worship service with hymn number 31. If you'd like to follow along in the hymnal, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. I'm going to be sitting on a stool. Um, otherwise, my wife's going to come up and make me sit down on the stool. But my doctor said, you can do this Sunday morning if you sit down. Um, so I'm gonna do that, and I hope you don't mind that. But we'll sing together, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, um, hymn number 31.
bow with me. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, when we sing Lost in Wonder, Love, and Praise, we look forward to that day when we're in your presence. We look forward to the day when we are perfectly holy. We look forward to the day when all of the struggles with the flesh are behind us. And yet, over the course of our lives, we look to you for your spirit's empowering. We look to you for the grace and mercy that you lavish on us so abundantly each day. We're so grateful to you for life itself. We're so grateful to you for eternal life. We're grateful to you for the promise of heaven and the promise of the glorification of your saints. And now as we come to you with love that is imperfect and yet focused on you, we pray, pray that you will receive our worship, that you will be glorified in our thinking and in our, in our singing and in our attentiveness to your word. We pray for our brothers and sisters throughout this world who are under persecution, who are uh, having difficulties because of um, the evil one. We know that you restrain him, we know that you govern him, and we know that through him you accomplish your divine purposes. And so we pray for the strength and the perspectives of those who are under persecution for the name of Christ, and just ask that you would undergird them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> hymn number 70, I am him and he, I am his and he is mine. <coughs> lights. I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> I know we're, we'll be celebrating Valentine's Day here soon, but you'll probably notice a theme to the music choices this morning. Speaks of love. Not only God's love for us, but our love in return to God. Ultimately, it's God's expression of what love is that we're speaking of this morning, how deep the Father's love for us. Oh, man. 
short, very short song, but it expresses, I love you, Lord. Merciful God, and I love that last line. Close with it. Then we will stand overwhelmed by the mercy of God. Merciful God. <clears throat>
As we prepare our hearts for the ministry of God's word, I want to once again thank David and Rick for ministering in my absence and uh, so effectively. Um, thank you. And some of you I have not met, visitors who are probably here before, but I wasn't here to meet you. But welcome. Good to have you with us. Good to have you with us too. And, um, I just want to say that before we go to God's word. I do invite you to bow with me, please. And Father, it is with delight that we do come to your word once again. It's with delight because those of us who love you are indwelt by your spirit who opens our understanding to your word, who opens the love of our lives to want to live according to your word who opens our hearts toward repentance when we fail to do that. And then coming together this morning as this portion of your kingdom, we are um, so thankful to you for your faithfulness. We look back at this week, literally every moment of this week, and we see your hand, we see your providence, we see your sovereignty, we see your, your love and your mercy and your guidance and um, all the gifts you've given to us, especially your spirit and your word and the gift of one another, the gift of a congregation, the gift of the congregation for those who are visiting us, their home churches. I pray for their pastors. I pray for their leaders. I pray for their congregations that you will minister to them as you minister to us powerfully and deeply, all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as we return after some weeks of absence from this wonderful book, 1 Corinthians. We're closing this morning chapter 6. Um, if you were to, actually our passage is chapter 6 verses 12 through 20. <clears throat> Excuse me, chapter 6 verses 12 through 20. If you were to ask 20 people to define the church, you would probably get that many different answers because by God's design, the church is multifaceted, multidimensional. But as Paul deals with the Corinthian church, and through this text deals with us as well, and our churches, he is focusing primarily on the fact that here is a group of people who were rescued from lives of sin and debauchery and brought together as a congregation. That's typical of every congregation. We are a congregation of sinners saved by grace, but not just sinners saved by grace, but sinners who are dependent on grace daily. Sinners who look to God for the grace, to live for his glory. That's part of the Christian lifestyle. Repentance when we sin, contriteness, genuine contriteness, brokenheartedness over our own sin brokenheartedness over the sins of the world, the sins that we see around us, but primarily our own sin. 
And so as we come together as a congregation this morning, we come together as people who understand forgiveness because we look to God for it literally daily. We come back to the gospel and to God's grace and to his mercy and his intent for our lives. That was the predominant thing that Paul was addressing with these Christians. Listen to how he described them. This is chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now we've studied each of those categories of sin, if you will. And we've seen that they refer to unrighteous, unrepentant, sinful lifestyles from which these people had been rescued. In fact, look at verse 11. Notice it carefully. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, that means set apart. You were justified, you were made legally righteous in God's courtroom. He declared you righteous, not based on your own righteousness, but the righteousness of his son taking upon you upon himself, your sin and my sin. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. So we have here the Corinthian congregation, which like every other congregation, is a local church made up of those who have been set free from their former enslavement to sin and who had been washed and sanctified and justified, but who were not yet glorified, who were not yet made perfect. And that's obvious from the fact that Paul has to deal with the sins that were common among them, as he has to deal with sin in our own life and among our congregations, as we seek to live according to his grace and seek his cleansing and his forgiveness. But sadly, in their case, Many of them had lost sight of the, of the wonder and the power of their initial salvation and had become prideful and divisive over non-essential things like the, the people who brought the gospel to them. You, you may recall some were saying, well, I am of Paul. Well, I am of Apollos, you know, the great Alexandrian orator. I'm, I'm Apollo's disciple. Well, no, I'm of Cephas. I'm of Peter, you know, the disciple of Jesus, the head of the whole group. He's my mentor. And then others who were super spiritual, well, I am of Christ. And, and they were dividing in the divisions and, and factions among them as if the men who brought the message to them were more important than the message itself or than the Christ whom the message glorifies. And Paul dealt with that head on, as we saw in the earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Paul, I'm sorry, Paul corrected them, and he did so in no uncertain terms, and exhorted them to guard their hearts against the deceitfulness of unrighteousness in any form. Now, when we come to today's passage, Paul is warning them against another problem, and that is the problem of using their freedom in Christ as a license to sin. Here's what it sounds like. I'm a Christian. I'm forgiven. When I sin, the blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. Therefore, I don't really need to take sin seriously. I mean, if I sin, I'm forgiven. Does that sound familiar? It should, because that's what you say. And that's what I say. In principle, every time we choose to sin, I'm forgiven. God, God will forgive me. Yes, I'm going to choose to violate his love. Yes, I'm going to choose to sin against the one who died for my sins. But he'll forgive me. Now, we probably don't do it flippantly, and maybe not in so many ways, but you understand the principle. Whenever we choose to sin, we are 
choosing to sin. We are trading on grace. We are relying on God's promise to forgive us, and he will come through. But as you probably know, too, and I have found out um, much to my shame, um, much to my embarrassment over the course of my life, God knows how to punish you. He knows how to punish me. He knows how to chasten those whom he loves, as Hebrews says, to bring about the, the precious fruit of righteousness. So it's not like we can get away with it. Not that we even want to, but I, I think you understand the principle. And they were, though, being blatant about it. And, and we'll see in just a moment how that was working out. Now, the backdrop to this, quite possibly part of the backdrop to their idea that they can sin without consequence, was the Gnostic teachers. I, we've talked a lot about the Gnostics, but in case you're not familiar with them or have forgotten, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word knowledge or to know. And there were, there were multiple groups of Gnostics in the first century and throughout the New Testament, Paul addresses them, John addresses them, especially in 1 John, and their errors, because their, their errors were insidious and their errors were damning. But if I kind of boil it down to some of their commonalities, the Gnostics taught that, they had this what they call philosophical dualism, all matter is evil, all spirit is good. So when it came to Christ, they taught that a good God would never take upon himself an evil material body. Therefore, they denied that Christ came in the flesh, and that's why John in 1 John repeats over and over again, if you deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you are not in the truth. You make God a liar and so on. Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh, but to deny that, as they did, is to deny his life, his death, his resurrection, his atoning work on behalf of all who trust in him, it, it is it's beyond insidious, it's damning. But they taught that. All matter is evil. Now when it came to believers, what it looked like quite often is your body is material. All material is evil. So you can't expect anything from your body except evil. And that has absolutely no bearing on your spirituality. Because all spirit is good anyway. Therefore, it is of no consequence if a professing believer or anybody sins because it's, that's what your body's going to do anyway. That's the best you can expect from it. Now that, in a sense, is oversimplifying it, but you get the idea. So when it came to Christ, they denied him because they denied the flesh. When it came to individuals, and in this case, believers, their influence was, it doesn't matter what you do in your body because all you can do is produce evil anyway. Now add to that the fact that the Corinthian culture, uh, the Corinthian city, the city of Corinth, was thoroughly pagan, thoroughly immoral, and home to the temple of Aphrodite, which you may recall was the Greek goddess associated with love and passion and procreation. The Roman equivalent of Aphrodite was Venus. The, the city of Corinth had a large hill outside the city, and on top of that hill was the temple to Aphrodite. And part of that temple worship was 1,000 temple priestesses who were, in fact, prostitutes. Every night they would come down into the city and ply their trade. To have relationships with one or more of these priestesses was considered to be an act of worship. And you, you had this monument, monumental immoral corruption going on. That's the culture out of which these Corinthian believers were saved. But it is also the culture that still had influences on them, and those influences were strong. So Paul, again, needed to confront it and to confront it head on. Here's how he did it, at least in part. In our passage this morning, he contrasts the lawful nourishment of the physical body 
with the sinful adulteration of that body. And then he exhorts them to pursue the rightful purpose of that physical body. Now that will serve as our outline. Follow along, please, as I read. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read beginning at verse 12 and then ending at verse 20. Excuse me just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. All things are lawful for me, Paul says, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will be mastered by I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one with the Spirit. In this, the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now let's take a look at that. Beginning with what I've titled the law, the lawful nourishment of the body. Talking here about the physical body. And then he will segue into the spiritual aspects of that physical body. The implications of what they were doing or what he was admonishing them not to do. So the lawful nourishment of the body. Now, when Paul, in verse 12, says lawful, he's referring um, to a principle that is general, applying to everything that God permits, but primarily foods for the body, because he's talking about nourishing the physical body. So in his illustration of the human body and its nourishing, he is referring more specifically to foods that nourish the body, and which are permissible by God's standard. Now, you will recall from a Jewish perspective that under the Old Testament covenant, many foods were not lawful. They were not permitted to eat them for various reasons, as explained in the Old Testament. However, under the New Covenant, in the New Testament, and I'm quoting here Paul in 1 Timothy 4.4, everything created by God is good. He's referring here to food. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. That's the primary verse that we use for table grace, for thanking the Lord before we partake of what he has provided. But the principle there primarily is that there are no longer restrictions on food, on dietary restrictions. Paul says, All things are lawful to me. And then he says, in referring to what is lawful, he says all things. And, of course, the con he isn't talking about all things everywhere. He's talking, again, about food. Everything in general that God permits. The context qualifies what he means by all things. Again, he's referring to foods that were previously unlawful under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, but which were now permissible under the New Covenant. Now, Paul states that same principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 29, and he adds to it some practical principles of how believers are to deal with our freedoms in Christ. And we'll look at those in more detail, especially in chapter 8 and later on when Paul comes back to them. But I want to just introduce them at this point from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says this, and this will sound familiar, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. 
all things are lawful, but not all things edify. That word edify from the Greek means literally a house builder, to build up. To edify somebody else is to build them up. Or to be edified is to be built up, primarily in Christ and in the Word. So all things are lawful, but not all things edify or build up. Let one seek his own good. I'm sorry, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Now, Paul gives a specific illustration, and you're probably familiar with it, but in case you're not, he's going to talk about meat sacrifice to idols. For the Jew, they were not to participate in that kind of idolatry. If a meat, and in fact, later on, Paul says, an idol is nothing. So meat sacrificed to idols is nothing. They're sacrificed to nothing. But to the Jewish mindset, to have meat that was sacrificed to an idol was an abomination. They would not eat it. They could not eat it. They literally couldn't stomach it. So Paul now uses the illustration because you have, including Paul himself, Christians, in many cases, who were Jewish, who had come out of Judaism, and some of them understood their freedom in Christ. Hey, I can now have a ham sandwich. That's good. I can now eat food sacrificed to idols. It doesn't violate my conscience. However, there were many others who were genuine believers who did not yet understand their freedom in Christ. And so for that believer to see another believer participate in eating meat sacrificed to idols, that would be highly offensive. But worse yet, that believer might be edified or built up negatively to participate in it when his conscience wasn't free to allow him to do that, which means he would be sinning against his own conscience. So that believer's freedom would have influenced the other believer's willingness to sin. You understand there? So Paul uses here the the very important illustration of meat sacrificed to idols. So here's what he says. I'm continuing now with the passage out of 1 Corinthians 10. He instructs them, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. In other words, it's not an issue. Go ahead and eat it. And why? Because the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. It's all of God. God created it. He provided it. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to eat anything that is set before you, an unbeliever invites you over to their home, you're a a Jewish Christian, and that unbeliever then offers you meat that was sacrificed to idols, he goes on to say, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, so you're there with a friend at an unbeliever's home, and that unbeliever very graciously offers you meat sacrificed to idols. And he says, don't ask, just enjoy. But if you're with somebody who leans over to you and says, that meat was sacrificed to idols, then Paul says, don't eat it. Don't eat it. This meat is sacrificed to idols. Do not eat it. Why? For the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean, not your conscience, but the other man's conscience. In other words, if if you have to offend someone, offend your host. Don't offend a fellow believer, and especially don't cause them to stumble. It is better to offend your host than to cause a Christian brother or sister to stumble. Now, there are other principles involved there that we'll see in in future weeks as we look at chapter 8 and beyond. But I want to come back now to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul is initially addressing this concept of don't allow your freedom in Christ to cause you to sin or to cause a weaker brother or sister to sin. And the weaker brother or sister being the one who has the freedom in Christ but doesn't have the freedom in their conscience yet. So returning to 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 12, there's a principle that he gives. He gives a series of principles here. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. In other words, it may be permissible for me, but that doesn't mean I should do it or have to do it, just because I can do it. 
especially if it doesn't edify either myself or others. I can give you an illustration. I think maybe I've shared this with you, but just very briefly. My late father-in-law, not Linda's father, but my late wife's father, Ralph, he and his wife were saved out of sin, but out of a a horrible um, alcoholic background. And the Lord very graciously completely removed any desire for alcohol from both of them. He doesn't always do that at the point of salvation, but he did for them. And I remember inviting Ralph to a uh, church Christmas party. I was um, at the time pastoring a church of adults. And one of the ladies brought a bottle of wine to share. It's a gracious gift on her part. When I saw that, I knew that my father-in-law could not handle that. I mean, because of his alcoholic background, plus he, he was saved at a Salvation Army service, so he had this whole orientation that you don't touch alcohol. It's a sin. No. I knew that would violate his conscience. And so I just took the lady aside, and I knew her very well. And I explained the situation and asked if she would be kind enough to put that bottle of wine away and not serve it. And she understood completely. She was very gracious about it. But just an illustration, my father-in-law had the freedom in Christ to participate, but his conscience was bound. And so he, as the weaker brother, needed to be edified, um, needed to not have to deal with that situation. So that's just one of many, many situations. We, even though we may have the freedom in Christ to do something, that doesn't mean we should do it or that we can do it. We need to be aware of others and edifying them and protecting them as well. So that, that's one of the principles. Another principle, he says, all things are lawful. This is verse 12, the latter part of verse 12 in chapter 6. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, I'm not going to abuse grace by surrendering my self-control or sacrificing the spiritual well-being of others simply because something is permissible. In other words, I will be master even over my liberties in Christ because there's more to be considered here than my personal freedom in Christ. There are others to be considered, and I will not be brought under the mastery of anything. There's a third principle. This is verse 13, the first part of verse 13. Food is for the stomach, And the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. In other words, it's all natural, it's all biological, it is all temporal. The physical body, as well as the nourishment of that body, will be ultimately done away with. It's temporal. No eternal consequences in that sense. However, and here's the segue, however... The physical body is more than, biologic, more than a biological mechanism. Paul now segues from the natural body to the spiritual implications of what we do with our bodies. From the temporal, literally, to the eternal. From the lawful nourishment of the body to what I'm calling here in point number two of our outline, the sinful adulteration of the body the sinful adulteration of the body. And Paul sets this forth in a series of statements. First of all, verses 13 and 14. The body is for the Lord. The body, the physical body, yours and mine, are for the Lord. He says it this way, verse 13. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. In that one brief statement, Paul destroys the false teaching that sexual immorality is of no consequence to the Lord or to the human body. He decimates it. The physical body has no role in one's sanctification is what the Gnostics were teaching and what some of these believers were being influenced by, and Paul just destroys that with one statement. Our bodies are the Lord's, and we are redeemed to live for his glory, and ultimately, 
our bodies will be raised up imperishable, fit to serve him for all eternity. What we do with our bodies now does have eternal implications and eternal consequences. So in verse 20, he says, for now, now that you're here, before you're glorified, before you have an imperishable body, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. It does matter what you do with your body, is what he's saying. So the body is for the Lord. The second point he makes is believers are members of Christ's body. This is the word picture that Paul uses throughout his writings. Believers are united with Christ and identified as members of his body. Now, of course, that is a word picture, but it's more than a word picture. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul says, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. But our unity with Christ is more than a word picture. It is a spiritual reality. In fact, so much so, listen, when a Christian commits sexual immorality, which is what Paul is warning them against, when a Christian commits sexual immorality, he or she brings Christ into that sinful union, which is unthinkable to Paul and should be, of course, to us as well. Therefore, Paul reasons, and this is verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. And the point here is sexual immorality is spiritual harlotry. Sexual immorality is spiritual harlotry. Harlotry. For a believer to adulterate the physical body through sexual sin is to commit spiritual harlotry as well as physical harlotry. Verse 16, do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one with her? For he says, he being God in the Old Testament, Genesis 2.24 specifically, For he says, the two shall become one flesh. Now that's a general principle of unity between a man and a woman, more specifically in Genesis 2.24, between the husband and the wife. And scripture calls that a one flesh union, the deepest, most intimate physical union, but it goes way beyond the physical. And that principle is true whether someone is a believer or an unbeliever. That physical union is harlotry when done illicitly. And for the believer, it is spiritual harlotry as well. Now, Paul is focusing here primarily on the physical aspect of that union. But by God's design, the married couple is to become one in every aspect of life, physical, spiritual, emotional, and so on, as symbolized in the physical act itself. However, verse 17 now, the one who joins himself to the Lord, that is in the salvation union, is one spirit with him. You are joined with the Lord by virtue of your salvation. Therefore, you must not drag Christ into an illicit, immoral relationship. That's the primary point. To enter into sexual immorality as a believer is to drag Christ into that immorality. Now, Paul adds an admonition and a warning because, another point here, sexual immorality is self-destructive. It's it's moral and spiritual suicide. It is self-destructive. Here's how Paul says it in verse 18. Flee immorality. Now remember, he's talking to believers. Believers can be and are tempted in the area of immorality. You know that. I know that. That's why we have to guard our hearts very carefully, guard our minds, what we feed our minds, because it will eventually issue in principles that govern our behavior. Be very, very guarded that way. 
So he says, verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Interesting principle. I want to read what one commentator says, because I found it helpful. And I'm quoting here. Excuse me. He says, sexual sins have their dwelling in that body which is part of our being, and which yet they tend to destroy. They make a man his own deadliest enemy. Now that would serve for women as well, but he's talking here in the masculine. They make a man as his own deadliest enemy. The source of uncleanliness is in the heart and in the thoughts which come from within and so defile the man. Now, other sins may be with and by means of the body and may injure the body, but none are so directly against the sanctity of the whole body as is the sin of fornication. He sins against his own body by alienating it from the service of him to whom it belongs. And of course, that's the Lord. By incorporating it in the degradation of another, by staining the flesh and the body, by subtly pointing, uh, poisoning the inmost sanctities of his own being through moral injury and defilement, close quote. All of that produced from within through sexual immorality. Now, in verses 19 and 20, Paul closes with this. And I've titled this The Rightful Purpose of the Body. The Rightful Purpose of the Body. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? In other words, the temple of the Holy Spirit is to be kept pure from defilement. It is the Holy Spirit's temple. Secondly, it is Christ's possession. Verses 19 and 20. And that you are not your own. Don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit who indwells you whom you have from God. And that you are not your own for you have been bought with a price. You know, for the Christian, there's no my body, my choice. It is his body that governs our choices or should. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul gathered the Ephesian elders last time he was going to see them, and among other things, he said, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You are not your own. You have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Similarly, Peter reminded his readers and this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. He said, you, are not, you were not redeemed, you were not purchased, you were not bought with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you were bought with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the language of sacrifice, as you know. That's the language of the death of the sacrifice, Jesus Christ. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price, and that price was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on that cross and took your sins and mine upon himself and released us from the bondage of sin, released us from hell released us from the wrath of God. We have been purchased. We belong to him. And then finally, our body is for God's glory. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now I remind you that within the Corinthian congregation were some, actually perhaps many, who had been sexually immoral, but who had been washed, who had been sanctified, who had been justified by Jesus Christ through the Spirit. But even to those who were saved out of immorality, Paul says, flee immorality. Don't get caught up in it again. Flee it. Christians can get caught up in sexual sins and can drag Christ into those illicit unions to which the Lord says, repent. Flee immorality. 
glorify God in your bodies. Please bow with me. Father, we repent. We repent of sinful thoughts. We repent, perhaps, of even sinful engagements um, with others outside of marriage, perhaps even the violation of our own marital covenants, whatever the sins might be in our past or present. Father, I pray that repentance would be ours. I pray that we would truly glorify you in our bodies. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that not only redeemed us, that not only saved us, but that cleanses us and that purifies us daily. We thank you for your great patience. We thank you for your enormous eternal love. We thank you that we who love you are your children and that you will not let us go. You will complete the work that you have begun in us. Father, I pray if there are any this morning who do not love you, who have not bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would call them to yourself, that this would be the morning of their salvation and they, that they would learn to live to your glory as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you should have any questions or comments that you would like to share with me, um, I would be happy to talk with you. I haven't really talked about the gospel itself. If you're not a Christian and you want to know what it means to be a Christian, please, I'd love to talk with you. We have others here who are very qualified in terms of their relationship with the Lord to share that gospel, that good news with you as well. Now I invite you to stand and I'm going to invite our musicians to come back. We're gonna sing one more song. And then I've asked Dave Tyndall if he would close our service in prayer. And in fact, I want to say, I am, I am delighted, I am so thankful that the Lord has brought Dave and Carol to us. I've known them for many years. Um, and Dave, who is accomplished in, in music and leading and singing and so on, let me know when he found out that, that Rick was sick and wouldn't be in the service, that Barb was sick and wouldn't be in the service, that I was sick and wouldn't be in the service. He said, if I can be of help, please let me know. So I put him in touch with Rick and they worked it out and now Dave, it's great to have you up here and, and part of the ministry team. And Carol is well versed on overhead slides and so on. So she's already helped in that area. But two very precious gifts to us for which we thank the Lord. And we're going to sing together one last song and then uh, Dave will close our service with prayer. And that song is number 386. My Jesus, I love thee. What a great song of commitment. Let's sing this together. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art filled with your praise, Lord, that you have done that work of redemption. You have called us unto yourself. 
You've made us unto yourself. And Lord, you've given your spirit within us to lead us and guide us, and we pray that you would continue to do that. Lord, send your people out with joy. Send your people out with your presence. And this we ask in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. Enjoy the